Thank you all for joining us. I'm Kai Haley. I'm one of the creators of this series, and I'm really excited to have you all here today. Um, a while back, I was in a visioning summit um, with Alex, and we were generating ideas for how to support more visioning work in the UX community at Google. And Alex brought up the topic of um, storytelling and narrative and how valuable that was. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, I need to know more about that. I, I don't have really strong skills in this area. And I figured I probably wasn't the only one having this reaction. So I'm really excited to be able to have Alex here today um, to talk about this subject. Um, Alex is currently a design lead on Google Lens. And uh, previous to that, he led teams on search, maps, payments, and ads. Before Google, he designed websites for the music industry and has an MS in um, info design and tech from Georgia Tech, along with a BA um, in English from the University of Georgia. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Alex to uh, talk to us about narrative. Hey, how's everybody doing tonight? So I wanted to start off with this quote by Joan Didion, uh, who's probably my living hero. And this is from her novel, The White Album. It's actually the first line of the novel, or excuse me, collection of stories, I should say. And in this, she really expands on 1960s California. But one of the th underlying themes is the stories people tell themselves to get through the day. And that really stuck with me, and that was one of the things I was thinking about as I put together these slides to give this talk today. So hi, I'm Alex. This is me. This is what I look like on our corporate network. I'm the UX lead for Google Lens. So for those of you who don't know, that's a new product that we're developing. It's a visual way to search, give you real-time answers to questions about the world around you. And I'm particularly excited about uh, working on this product. I've only transitioned to working on it about a month ago. But the idea to do something in the computer vision space and create these new types of interaction design were super exciting to me. And I'm really happy to be a part of this team and be pushing the boundaries of what we can do with technology while also giving people the best of Google search. So let me tell you about my talk today. First of all, I waited way too late to start. Second of all, I made my slides at the last minute. Third, I probably should have rehearsed more. And last, I really hope that you'll like it. So who's excited to hear this talk now? <laughs> Yay, good. So what I just told you was a story. And sadly, it is a true story. But we're going to make the best of it that we can today. Because there are many ways that you can tell a story. And that's going to be one of the themes that I go upon about today. And so what if I told you something different, a different story of my life, per se? So I could start off by saying my parents were engineers. They both graduated from Georgia Tech. I moved away to sell violins in the desert when I turned 22. I went to Arizona. I liked music. I thought, why not work at a violin shop? I had the whole world figured out. Then when I was there, uh, my girlfriend's uncle, who did part-time work for the city of Tucson as a draftsman, showed me Photoshop and showed me some valuable lessons with keyboard shortcuts that I still use today. And after that, I went on to go work in the music industry and I design sites for Kanye West, Jay-Z, Bon Jovi, and a bunch of other artists, although I never met anyone famous while I was there. This is also a true story, and hopefully this one was a much more interesting story. So when I think about stories, I also try to think about the collective story of this experience that we're having together. And so I'm looking out of the audience and I'm thinking about all of your stories as well. And I'm thinking, why did you come to this talk? Is it professional development? I might not be the best candidate for that, but fingers crossed. Kill some time before the commute. Well, OK, that's a good reason, too. Free drinks? That's also a great reason to come to a talk, I guess. And all these things may be true, but in the end of the day, I like to believe something a little bit different about why we're all collectively here together. I believe that we're here because we're designers and we really love our craft. 
And I think that this is more than a hobby or a profession for us. It's something that we want to practice daily. It's something that we want to be really good at. It's something that we think about even in the off hours, perhaps even when we wake up in the middle of the night. And I ask myself, why is that? I believe that we are designers because we want to change the world. I believe that's what design is. We have a future for what the world can become and what the power of technology can enable for users everywhere. And I believe that this, at some level, is what drives us and makes us really want to practice our craft and really do the best that we possibly can do because we all believe in this story of what technology can do for people. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's get started. So one of the things that I like to remember is that we live in a really magical time, especially in how it relates to technology. And if we think about the world of our grandparents, say 50 years ago, the amount of technological improvement we've had since then is staggering. We didn't have things like this to enable us on our daily lives. And I think if we could have shown them what these phones could do, they would have been completely blown away. And there's a quote that I like from Arthur C. Clarke, who is the author of 2001. Maybe a little dystopian for this talk. I want to keep this a little more positive. But he keeps, uh, makes a good point when he says that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And if you think about what we can do with technology, the fact that we can communicate with anyone anywhere in the world at any time, that truly is magic. And that's magic that did not exist for people 50 years ago. It didn't even exist for people 20 years ago. And technology, it really gives people superpowers. And we think all of us are living off technology. We, you know, we, our jobs revolve around technology. We think of all the small business owners who now have been more enabled. We think of all the people who now are able to have discussions online, who are able to express themselves. The things that we can do as people because of technology are really amazing, especially when we think about it in the lens of what we could do 50 years ago. But one thing I like to remind myself is magic is not enough. And I think it's easy, especially in the Silicon Valley world, to be seduced by technology. And the latest engineering it doesn't always lead to the greatest experiences. It doesn't lead to successful products. And the greatest engineering doesn't always lead to world change. And I think as designers, what we're really passionate about is changing the world. And that's something that we want to make sure happens. And when I think about what our role really is as designers, and the story we want to tell, I think of us as the magical realists of technology. And for those of you who don't know, magical realism was a literary movement. The central figure was an author named Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And one of the themes of magical realism is that supernatural, otherworldly things happen to normal people regularly. It was almost like a common occurrence. And when I think about that and what we do as designers, I think our job is to take this magic and really deliver that and turn these extraordinary events into ordinary everyday stories so that someone can pull out their phone 50 times a day and do magic and think nothing of it. That's when we've really succeeded as designers. And we have this phrase at Google, maybe you have it other places, what we call it toothbrush tasks, those things that you do every day. And I think that's the power of what we can do with technology and with storytelling. So this is the part where we kind of shift from a little bit more of sort of the background of the story into going in a little bit more of where I see this experience from learning, getting a literature degree, a journalism degree, and thinking about narrative has helped me as a designer in the work that I do. I think this is usually where a talk uh, can go from feeling a little bit fluffy to maybe a little bit boring, but I'm hoping that I can give you the best of both worlds and really get it fluffy and boring for you. <laughs> So there's another quote I like, which is, storytelling is the greatest technology that humans have ever created. And this is by John Westenberg, who's a VC, and he's a tech writer. He might be a blogger. I don't think he'd like to be called a blogger, but you know, tech writer, we'll go with that. And he talks about storytelling as the way that we can communicate our ideas to other people and have those become emotionally resonant, which is very important, especially if we're designers and we want to share our ideas and get them across to our partners and to our users. He has a great article that you can read on Medium, and he goes on to expand with a lot of techniques for storytelling. Make it relatable. Tie into a bigger narrative. Use facts and figures so that you can anchor the story in something real. And all of these are good techniques for thinking about your design work and the storytelling that you're going to go do. 
And so when I think more about this and like what it is that we really design, like at the end of the day, because I know we all have these sort of like responsibilities and deliverables that we have to give as part of our jobs. And I think at the end of the day, the truth is that we design these experiences. And this is not just giving people specs, flows, assets, icons. We're really thinking more about how people are using the technology. That's really what it gets down to. And all the things that we make every day really come out as the way people are going to use the technology. And when you think about what an experience is, an experience is really just a story. It's a connected chain of events, has a character, has a setting, it has a narrative flow. And the thinking about experience of stories is the thing that I think can be really helpful when you think about how to do design work with narrative. And I think when we really get down to it, experiences are the story of how people use technology. And that's what we do as designers every day, is we tell the story of how people are using technology. And storytelling can be particularly effective because when we tell stories, they have emotional resonance with people and they can create empathy and understanding for our users. And that's what we want to do, right? We want to create this technology to empower our users, and we want people to understand the desires and conflicts of our users. And so by using storytelling, we can find a way to help tell the, uh, bring the perspective of our users closer to the people that we work with and the people that we collaborate with. And one of the main techniques for this is called narrative arc. And this is a pattern that's pretty much every story ever written follows some variation of this. It starts with something called the exposition, which is the beginning, kind of sets the stage. There's a conflict, there's a desire that's unmet that needs to be fulfilled. There's an escal escalation where it becomes more urgent. There's a climax, falling action, and then we reach the resolve with the resolution. And you can basically track any movie, book, anything back to this. But I think you can also track a lot of design projects back to this, or the story of how people are going to be using technology. So one example that I mapped out was learning to use social media. And so uh, recently my father has become very active on social media. It's been a little strange to watch, uh, especially in his 60s, but he's loving life, so it's good. And if we think about the exposition as starting, I mean, how do I want to share a photo on social media? That's a very common problem that people have when they start to use social media for the first time. And we can think about the conflict as they have this photo. It exists in their email, maybe in their Google Drive, maybe in Google Photos. And they need to get this photo out of email, out of Drive, into social media, and share it. An escalation could be as simple as they can't find the button. They're looking for the share sheet, whatever it is that enables them to do the sharing. The climax, they find that moment where they think they have the solution. They think they see what will work. The falling action, okay, all right, now I need to write a little bit of a caption, or maybe I need to include some hashtags, or maybe I just need to make this thing a little bit more lively. And the resolution can go all the way to someone thinking that they're an influencer, which is a little silly, but that is why people post on social media, right? They want to get those likes. They want to feel like they're being heard, listened to, or validated. And so speaking of my dad, here's a picture of him. And he's a good times guy, really personable. Everybody loves my dad. But lately, he's had some health issues. He's had some heart problems. And we had to have a pretty tough conversation with him about being more active. And the doctor really broke it down to him. And he's like, look, you're at a point in your life where you can either make changes to your lifestyle or you cannot, but you're running out of time. And so then thinking back about that, he starts to go through a different narrative arc, which is, all right, now I have to make a change and now I need to become more active. So we have that same narrative arc, but the exposition is different. This is something that's more driving him on a personal level rather than just using technology. But this is the reason why he became so active on social media. He wanted to be more physically active. But the conflict is that it's really hard to get motivated to exercise, especially when you haven't done it in years. The escalation comes, he's seeing all these people post about exercising on social media, and he's seeing their stories, and he's thinking, why can't I do that? The climax comes when he realizes, I can actually post 
and then maybe I'll motivate myself to actually do this thing that I was not able to do in my life. Falling action, he posts regularly. All of a sudden, he's walking more. Resolution, he actually walked 100 miles in July. He made a pretty substantial lifestyle change, and he's kept that up, and we've all been really proud of him, and this is something that he was able to do thanks to social media. Another big narrative technique is called the hero's journey. And this is another standard way to tell stories. And this is very common when we think about Star Wars, Harry Potter, science fiction, any work of fantasy. And it really revolves around a character making a big change. And it always starts the same way. It's an ordinary person from an ordinary world. They get a call to adventure. They might question themselves. They decide to go for it. They slip into the unknown world where everything goes upside down. There are many trials, tests, tribulations. They go through an intense period of self-doubt. They grab the sword. They take the road back. They return to the regular world, a changed person, and walk among the normal people. And I've also found this one to be pretty effective with thinking about how people can master a new technology or master a product and really start to become more effective at the goals that they have. And a long time back when I was working on ads, we saw this particularly. And I was working on a product called AdWords, which maybe a lot of you know. And we had a lot of people who were small business owners. And small business owners were really curious about getting more online, advertising, having a bigger presence, and making sure that they could do the thing they wanted to do at a larger scale. And we saw tons of stories like this, people who sold muscle car accessories. But the one that really sticks with me is this woman who was selling quilting uh, goods. And so she comes from the ordinary world. She's a quilter. She runs a small business. She doesn't think she's technical. At first, she refuses the call. Why would I join AdWords? I'm not going to be able to figure that out. She crosses the threshold. She signs up. She goes through the ordeal. It's a difficult challenge. It's a struggle. She has to learn all these new concepts. She has to figure this out uh, for herself, really. Goes to seizing the sword. She's running multiple ads. She's running multiple campaigns. She's figuring it out. And then she does this concept of returning with the elixir, which now she's known as the technical person among all her friends and family. She's helping her mom advertise her business online, and people are going to her with questions. And she's able to make a transformation through using this product. And telling the story of this is helpful for telling the story of how we might get other users onto AdWords, or how we might get other users onto comparable products. Understanding the desires and struggles of our users enables us to really solve the real world problems, like in the previous example. And a while back, I worked on another ads product called DoubleClick Sales Manager. And we saw a similar thing, where people were coming in, they were learning the technology, and then they were enabled to do things that they weren't able to do before. And when working on that product, we did a lot of field studies. And we would go out and we'd sit down with the, uh, the advertisers and the publishers, and we would learn more and more about their business. And in doing this, I learned an essential part of the story for salespeople, which is that they're always on the phone because you know the salesperson type, right? They're wheeling, they're dealing, they're calling up. They sell because they're personable and they have to have that human connection to do so and that requires being able to talk. What we also learned is that it was really hard to use a computer and the phone at the same time. And we always saw this physical action they would do where they would be on a call, put it up to their ear, drop down, slump, start typing, ask a question, go back to the phone, and alternate back and forth. And at the time, I was talking with the user researcher on the product, and we started to think about this a little bit more. And we're like, wouldn't it be great if we had something that they could actually use while they were on the phone that could really be part of this story that we want to tell to salespeople and when we create this new product for them? And so with that, we wrote a brief. And a brief, it's nothing but a story, right? It's you know, what the conflict of the user is and what we want to resolve for them. And we took that brief back to engineering and we kept stressing that salespeople are going to need this one-handed experience. And at first, we were dismissed, but we kept at it. 
And that was something that we were able to eventually work into our product requirements document. We were eventually able to get engineering on board with and uh, really kind of go all the way with this. And so in the end, what we designed and launched was a visual forecasting tool that salespeople could use with one hand. And the reviews of it from the users were pretty astounding. In fact, people told us that they gave them superpowers, uh, which made us feel like we'd done a really good job and we'd have really addressed and solved their needs. On the other side, because we had pushed for this and stressed that they were on the phone, one of the engineers had actually taken that and run with it too, and had come up with a way that we could do better, more real-time forecasting. And we were actually all able to get a patent off this because we stressed that the experience had to be uh, so complete and so fast for our users. So now I want to shift just a little bit more and talk about um, some more things along in my design process. And one of the things for me that I think about quite a bit is that uh, I don't necessarily think of design as being more like an interaction designer or being more like a visual designer. I tend to think of it more like I'm directing a movie, which may sound a little strange, but just bear with me. I think that a lot of what we do, especially when we design for mobile phones and we think about people using them, is that we don't control the environment. We have to think a lot about where they're doing, what they're going, where they're physically located, are they driving, are they talking on the phone when they get a notification, all those things around them. And by thinking more along these lines, it's been really helpful for me to think more about deeper experiences and how they will really resonate with users. So the best book that I've ever read on design uh, was by uh, Sidney Lumet, who's an author, 12 Angry Men, um, Dog Day Afternoon. Uh, sorry, he's a movie director. Excuse me, I slipped up there. Um, but this book has been fantastic for me to read because in it, it's a really technical description, more or less, of how you make a movie. And he goes through every part from that, from the scripts to finding the talent, to working with the actors, to setting the budget, to the technical aspects of how you work the camera and get the shot. And why he doesn't talk about interaction design, visual design, or anything that we might be doing on a daily basis, I found this to be really relevant and have abstracted this and think a lot about the techniques in this book and use them uh, almost every day. And he has a great quote in here, which is all great work is preparing yourself for the accident to happen, which I think has been really important, especially as we think about design and the story that we're trying to tell. We may not actually know the ending of this story, especially when we're deep in a project. We know the outcome, but we don't know quite how it's going to resolve. And so I try to think about this as we're working on projects and we know that we have a desired effect, the emotional resonance that we want to get to users, but we don't quite know how we think the story will end. So one of the most valuable lessons that I got out of this particular project was what uh, they call studying the scene and really making sure that we create the right tone for the narrative because that's going to underscore the message that we send. And you know, to bring it back to magical realism, this Gabriel Garcia quote, I think, was really relevant for me to think about a lot because you have to start a project by thinking through the brief. You can't go back to the brief at the end of the project. It's really important to kick that off and make sure that you underscore that the whole way because then you will actually get the effect that you want. And I'm sure a lot of you have thought about this as well, but we have a problem with the way that we do design which is a lot of times we set our products in Silicon Valley, which is good maybe for us, but if I hear another pitch about Uber for coffee or something else ridiculous like that, I might vomit. And to be honest, if we're designers and we really want to change the world, that's the thing that we want to do, I think we need to think a little bit bigger than maybe our backyard. So one project that we did here at Google that was particularly inspiring for that was called Urban Jungle. And what we wanted to do with that was kind of break out of this Bay Area mentality and not necessarily think about how we might design maps for driving directions, but how we could design it for all kinds of transportation. So the research team came up with a plan and they decided to target four locations across the world. And they conducted very extensive field studies. 
They picked these locations because they were somewhat the same in the fact that mostly people relied on public transport, but also because they were very different, both in terms of nationality, language, and just all the, you know, even geographic location, right? They're in different places in the world. Some of them are in the middle of continents. Some of them are right on the coast. So here's a little clip of some of the movies that they made when they conducted these extensive field studies. And this was really helpful in sort of setting the scene because when they talked about this work, they were able to bring people in and really show them the perspective. It's not just enough for us to say, let's design for uh, a particular location, but we really needed to show what it meant to be in that location. The team also did something that I thought was particularly amazing, which is they created a research gallery, a gallery where everyone could learn about the studies. Because we can make the videos, we can send them out via email, but it's not always the best way to reach people. Especially, it's not the best way to reach people when they're receptive to hear a story. So they created this room, and this is a panoramic shot, and it had all the video clips playing. They had a lot more information about the locations, photos, where they went on the field studies, and really drove it home what these locations were like. They also did an ingenious thing where they put this almost by the entrance of the building. So almost everyone had to walk through this. And what you saw every day was people would linger, they would go through it, they would spend a lot of time there. And they really were able to capture the attention of the audience much more than they were uh, just through even making the videos. And the last part is it doesn't stop there because that's the research work. Then the design phase happens. But the team produced these shared design elements to make sure that they had continuity throughout the project and made sure that they followed the setting that they created. And these were used in all the sprints, the design mocks, everything that the designers produced and created because they didn't want to go back to that notion of anyone slipping in, hey, a San Francisco restaurant or you know, something down in Mountain View. They really wanted to make sure that as they were reviewing the project, they went all the way with this and really set it in the locations that were important. And the project was really successful internally in shifting the focus from these Bay Area locations to thinking about more global ones. And by setting the scene, they were able to do this and really carry it all the way through from the beginning to the end. Another lesson uh, that I learned from making movies, uh, I call framing the shot. And it's when we are making design deliverables, decks, smocks, whatever you want to call them. But really thinking through, are we showing the right things to communicate the design that we want to communicate? And there's a story in making movies where Sidney Lumet is talking to Akira Kurosawa, the director, who's filming a movie about ancient Japan. And he's talking about the positioning of the camera. And he's telling him that if I moved it an inch this way, he'd get a factory. And an inch this way, he would get the airport. So we had to frame the shot just so, so he could communicate that message. And that's always stuck with me because I think like as I give a presentation, as I make these things to talk about the experiences that we want to share with people, we got to get it exactly right so there's no questions so that people can understand where we're coming from as designers. And this is really important on a project I worked on where we updated the Google identity. Uh, we called this Glyph internally. Uh, but we started out with one really big problem, which is that the Google logo wasn't working on mobile. And the old Google logo uh, was horizontal, rectangular. It was very hard to get that down to something that people could recognize in a sea of apps. So we got to work with a team called Creative Lab internally, who are some of the best storytellers that I've ever worked with. A lot of people there have background in the advertising industry, and they bring that experience. And every time that I work with them, I literally take notes, just you know how they pitch, how they share their ideas, how they frame them visually. And I've learned so much being uh, part of projects with them. And they produced this deck where they really dug into like why Google wasn't translating to mobile. Because it was important that when we went to our engineering and product management stakeholders that we could talk about this in a way that they could see and understand. And there was a set of examples like the ones that I've just shown, which show how difficult at the time it was for people to recognize that they were on Google, for Google to stand out in the sea of applications that, they were working, uh, that were available to them on their phones. And by framing it this way, 
people were able to immediately grasp the problem and understand that updating the logo was not just an exercise that designers wanted to go through, but was something really important for the Google brand and for our products. There were also some other things that were going on at that particular time, which is we were launching voice search very heavily, and we were starting to think of different ways that you could communicate with Google. And those were challenging because one, we had interaction design problems that we also had to solve. But two, we also had some brand things because we want people to know when they're talking to Google. We want to understand that the mic is doing the search. We want to understand that Google is coming back with results. And we definitely want to understand when uh, people to understand when Google is speaking so they don't talk over it. As part of this exercise, we all work together on this you know, collaborative set of motion design exercises and detailed interaction specs. And it was really important for us to frame out every piece of this so that we could communicate what was going on with the state of Google, but also how we were updating the brand and why updating the brand made this new set of features possible. And at the end of the project, we presented this. It was actually a prototype. Um, to Sundar, uh, I got to be the phone boy to hold it and hand it over to him, the best day of my life. <laughs> and we showed him exactly what it was going to look like on the phone. And that was also really important for him to be able to see that framed in such a way so that he knew that we had delivered on the promise of the brief, that we had actually gone through and executed on transitioning Google to mobile and enabling this new technology of voice search. And the last concept I want to talk about uh, is called immersion. And that, you know, like, if you literally like, look up the word, like immersion means to be like, dunked underwater. But when we think about immersion in terms of storytelling, uh, it's when you watch a very captivating movie or you're reading a very captivating book and you feel completely absorbed into that world. And you feel like you feel maybe exactly what the character feels at that particular moment. And immersion is really, I mean, the thing that like drives good storytelling, right? And that's when I think people really start to relate, perhaps even shift their perspectives. So there's this quote from Janet Murray, who is my graduate advisor, um, who was a literature professor, who became a gamer, who then went on to run the digital media program at Georgia Tech. And she had this quote, and I think this is probably, if there's one quote in this that's the reason why I'm here today, it's probably this one because it's really affected how I think about design, particularly in terms of motion design and prototyping, which are two techniques that are very important to me in communicating design ideas. And this quote goes that, we don't suspend the disbelief as much as we actively create belief. And this is kind of like the X-Files, you know, that I want to believe. It's exactly that same thing. But what we see happens sometimes when we give motion sketches or prototypes to our cross-functional partners, we give those to PMs, engineers, they may look at it and initially being dismissive. But if we can immerse them in the designs, if we can get them to actually believe that they're real, sometimes you see the light go off. And you hear people go from, we can never do that, into that mode where, well, if we had this one thing, then we could do that. Or maybe if we had this one team do this, do that. And that should be one of our goals, is to get people excited and thinking about how we can all solve problems together, not just convince them of our ideas, but how we can collectively move forward with the design work we want to do. And with this, this was particularly important to me when I worked on a project um, for search, which was material design. And so when we initially launched uh, material design, uh, we had some difficulties thinking about how that would work for search because we launched this new design system that was very elegant. Uh, we had the colors, we had the iconography. We also had a lot of motion. And search at that time had a very, very restrictive design system. And it was really a challenge for us to think, how can we take this design system that we have and this material design system and really rationalize them into something that's going to be compelling? We saw a lot of ways that we could put it together, but it took a lot of thinking for us to really come up with the ideas and how we could execute on this idea of making search feel fluid and modern. And so one of the big things that we did is working with the motion designers on the team, uh, and we bought some B-roll online, and we made a clip, and we started to share that with people. And I'll roll that for you right now.
So what we really wanted to do was tie this back to a bigger user journey, because we didn't want to just show a bunch of animations or new design concepts, but we wanted to show how having this would enable people to fluidly move between surfaces on Google. So we came up with a scenario of planning a camping trip and really going through all the parts that someone might do as they do research on where to go camping, how they might pick a location, how they will eventually navigate to get there, and what the effect will be when they actually go camping. Because the goal of using this technology is actually to go away and not use technology. It's to have a great camping trip and to really feel like you've escaped, which was one of the, the undercutting themes that we used uh, in the design conversations. And so we shared this back out with the people on the team, and we were able to get really great buy-in from our stakeholders, from the engineers, from the other people around us. And so we started to work on the project more intently and develop out the design system now that we had you know, all the buy-in that we needed. But we still had a few problems in getting this thing done and out the door. And so with that, because we built something that extensively relied on web animations, engineering was very concerned, particularly with the, the rigorous design system that we had on search, didn't allow for a lot of flexibility, and there were a lot of questions on whether or not we would be able to deliver on that. And so we created a set of prototypes, and we shared those around with the engineers. And we had that moment where people were being dismissive, they weren't believing until they actively started to create belief, that moment that I talked about before, which was one of the engineers started to play with it and was like, I bet we could do this if we got the Chrome team involved. And then literally that design conversation continued and we got the Chrome team involved and the Chrome team is fantastic. They love web animations. And so by bringing them in, we were able to really get the thing going and go from making a prototype to making a more real version to actually running a live demo that we experimented with so that we could validate the design completely. But the prototypes were key, especially with the engineers, because it wasn't just a movie. It was something that they could play with. And as they played with it, they could imagine using it themselves and really feeling like what Google search could be like when they uh, had this experience. So we created this. Uh, first version of the prototype, and it actually went a lot farther than we ever expected because not only did it become our design spec, but it actually became something that we demoed in the 2014 I.O. keynote and became part of the story of what material design meant for Google. And that was another pretty special moment. So lastly, I'll just say that, um, you know, because I'm working on a more visual product, but also because I believe in these more cinematic experiences, I really think immersive design is a lot more of where our industry is headed and what we're going to be talking about as designers, especially as we get closer to AR, but also as I'm thinking about the experientialness of the um, more cinematic, more emotionally resonant, and the things that we're going to be able to do with technology that we're developing now. So here's a little clip that I wanted to show. I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King. Yeah. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slavery will they be able so yesterday was the 55th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. So I always try to listen to it on the anniversary, and I was reminded of this and really wanted to make sure that we included it, not only for Martin Luther King, but also for the fact that I believe that this kind of work is going to be more and more what we do as designers, and I'm particularly excited about that and to think about what we're going to be able to do for users. So in closing, I just want to say that I believe design to be a never-ending story. And that as technology evolves, and becomes realer, more immersive, that the work we're going to have to do as designers is going to be more important than ever. And I'm pretty excited for all the work that we will do collectively as an industry. I'm excited for the things that I'll hear about all of y'all doing. And uh, I'd love to hear more about it after, but I know that's another story. So thank you.
<laughs> so you, you talked a little bit about the prototyping and how it became your design spec. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that process and also what tools or how did you create the prototype? So what we try to do uh, when we have a project that's particularly interactive, involves a lot of motion, something that we really want to be able to convey how it feels, because I think prototyping is really important for how it feels, is we try to have someone, whether it's a designer who has prototyping skills or maybe what we call a UX engineer at Google on the project from the get-go, uh, particularly because they can be contributing ideas. And we start off with a pretty shallow version of that. It may be closer to a click-through. But we try to make that as high fidelity as quickly as possible. Even if there's a couple of design variations, we try to track them so that we know we're executing on the realest thing that we possibly can. And with that, we just keep building it up, sharing it, showing it, workshopping it, getting people excited about it, um, sending out links, and really making sure that people know to look at that, not just the deck, not just the, you know, the mocks, not just anything like that. Um, as far as tools, I'm actually going to be pretty tool agnostic in this. I believe that really what you're designing is the effect and the experience. And so I know that different UX engineers do things different ways. We have had a lot of you know people do different frameworks internally, different techniques. But I think the most important thing is more that you're communicating the design as faithfully as possible, and that, uh, particularly for us at Google, when we work with search and maps, that we're showing the realest data possible. So we're telling that honest story with the prototype. Was, was the prototype, when you say it became the spec, right? Did it really replace the spec, or was there still a design spec with you know, call-outs and behavior specifications and, and mock-ups and so on? Or did it completely replace that? You, engineers, product managers, QA were just basically saying, go look at that's the spec prototype. Don't worry about any mockups or specs yeah, or anything like that. We were referencing the prototype as the spec, but there were still a lot of annotations that we had to give people in terms of like the motion curves and the particular pieces that needed to be communicated. So the spec in terms of the behavior was matched to that. Um, and one of the engineers even actually wrote a visual diff so they could look at the real build and then look at the prototype and see that the motion curves was tracking. So it was used uh, more as a spec in that regard, but we never escaped giving annotations. What do you think is going to be the ideal way that UX and UI can connect? In about prototype and then the actual execution that design half onto it. Like, what do you think is going to be the best a scenario for that communication. In the, the scheme of this, you know, telling a story is kind of like we're making the movie of what we want this experience to be. And I think that's going to vary tremendously on what the project is and what people are trying to do. Um, in some cases, we may need more of a prototype. In some cases, it may be more motion design. In some cases, it may be, you know, more detailed visual design that needs to go on. But I think the real art of this is figuring that out and making sure that we're sticking to the story of what we want the effect of the design to be and communicating that constantly. I have two parts to my question. First, if you could um, define in to you personally the word narrative, and if you could um, say if you think that narrative is a constraint in the design process, is that a new idea, do you think? Um, so personally, I would say that I use narrative and story interchangeably. Um, do I think it's a new idea? I would say no. Maybe talking about it this formally is newer, but I think it's always been there, right? So if I think about, say, Douglas Engelbart creating the mouse, like he had a story of what he wanted technology to be like. He had this notion that he could get away from the command line and that someone would be able to directly manipulate objects on the screen in a user interface. And that was part of the inherent you know, design execution, hardware execution, whatever you want to call it there. And maybe it wasn't explicitly told as like, this is the story, this is what we want. But I believe if you map it back to that narrative, um, narrative arc, right? Users had trouble you know, figuring out what to do with the command line. 
They saw the tangible thing that they wanted. They wanted to touch it and manipulate it. They got to the point where we were able to create that and then people were able to have different kinds of interfaces. And I think that's true even like you could apply that back to, I don't know, touch screens on a phone. It's the same thing. It's like, why do we have to do this with the keyboard? Why do we have to do this with the mouse? Why can't we just touch it and have it? You talked about converting non-believers to believers um, through storytelling or narrative. What about people that are really focused on ROI of design and they really want to understand? They say, yeah, that's, that's kind of cool, but what's the ROI? And so not every company is like Google is, for example, when everyone appreciates design across the organization. A lot of companies struggle to get people to even understand the value of that. So how would you apply narrative and storytelling in a way that would try to convert non-believers that are focused on ROI to become believers? Yeah. Well, I hope I haven't. Yeah. Well, I should say Google has changed and design has become a, a bigger part of our product development process, but it hasn't always been that way um, for sure. So I, I feel like I, I definitely understand a little bit of where you're coming from. I think a big part of telling a story is knowing the audience and focusing on the things that they care about. And so if I were going to go back to, um, where do you work again? Forrester Research. Uh, so if I was going to go back to Forrester, I would try to understand what's motivating the audience. And like, if ROI is really the thing, how do I tell the story using ROI so that it will resonate with them and really cut across? Um, now, I don't know what ROI they're actually looking for, so I'm you know flying blind here, but I definitely know that like when we talk to say product managers, we use very different language than when we talk to engineers. And so I might say like the designs will be robust and easy to implement and you know it'll be no problem to create the variations when we give you the components when we talk to engineers. With product managers, it's like this feature will get adoption. Yeah. Definitely. Really enjoyed your talk. I'm curious about the prototyping process. Um, since prototyping, especially the level of prototyping you're showing, it takes a lot of time. And not every company has army of interaction designers who can, you know, dedicate themselves to that, especially in Silicon Valley, because we want to move fast. Do you think there's the prototyping still has an important role uh, in interaction design or now the prototyping is being done when the coding starts and then, you know, the prototyping happens? Yeah, I think um, there's an interesting part in making movies where he talks about this a little bit. And yeah, I forget the actress's name, but you're looking at her and she looks beautiful and well dressed. And if you go from behind, it's actually ripped and like pinned up in like 17 different places. And I, when I think of prototyping, I don't think like we're building the robust thing that we're actually going to ship. I think about it as like we need to get this thing in the camera lens so that we can communicate the maximum fidelity to our audience. But it doesn't have to be any bit real after that. I think there are a lot of techniques for doing that. And I think a lot of the prototyping tools that we see coming up um, from Envision and from other people are enabling uh, pretty much anyone doing interaction design to learn a little bit of code and a little bit of technique and how that work and make that part of their design process. I wanted to ask, how does storytelling, how is storytelling different in augmented reality and as we approach augmented reality? And what role does it play in your work at Google Lens? Um, we were talking about something today, uh, which is how the user focuses the frame. And someone brought up the comment, what happens if the user steps back and trips over something? And I never actually thought about a user falling down while, you know, <laughs> experiencing my product or whatever. So uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of ramifications when we get into like the actual like physicality of design and people moving through um, through real space. I also think, um, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I go, I will. I also, I work in a building where a lot of people are just standing around wearing VR headsets and I know they're testing, but I still think it's really hilarious when you turn a corner and someone's got a VR headset and they're like. <laughs> and uh, I, I haven't been able to get over that yet, but uh, it, it's definitely gonna, yeah, change the way we experience the world. 
I'm coming at this from a, a content strategy and UX writing angle. <laughs> and I really want to understand um, narrative in terms of, there's lots of different types of narrative, right? We can use narrative uh, while we create a user flow or journey. We can do it as a way to pitch something to our stakeholders. But then there's also in product. And I'm wondering how much of narrative is, you know, from beginning to end, encased in product? Or is it really just, is narrative more of a backstory that informs the product in a more meaningful way? Does that make any sense? I think that, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Uh -huh. I think you can't get meta-narrative, right? Like no one wants to read a story about how they're going to use a product. That, that would be really uh, terrible experience. And I think you can't overdo it in the process too. Like, um, I think it's important to talk about people's desires and motivations and like what they want to do. But there's such a thing as like too much backstory. And I'm sure people have seen this where there's like user personas where that goes into detail about like what they ate for breakfast and all these other things. And it's just like, that's not helping move the, you know, the process along. And a lot of times, you know, personally, like I'm thinking these things about storytelling or movie making or whatever. But this isn't what I'm saying to people. You know, this is how I'm kind of preparing and thinking about it from a pitch. A lot of that, I mean, is internal. And you know, this is one of the first times that I've ever like given a talk on that or shared a lot of that. But I would say um, just as much as needed and no more. Thank you all for coming. Hopefully you'll join us next week for design is next week, next month, <laughs> uh, not so soon, uh, for design is sci-fi. So thank you very much. <laughs>